Thank you. And I know I'm standing between you and lunch, uh, and we're slightly behind, so if I start speaking really, really fast, please stop me. Um, because just as Jenkin X, I have a lot of opinions. I'm going to talk today about something um, that I've come across as a problem during all of my years doing IT from different angles. Why is it so damn hard to write good alerts, messages, warnings? Just because I know in the developer uh, world, I, no one knows who I am. So just a very quick recap. I, I've, all I know is building software. I've been building software for my entire adult life in one way or another. I usually say that I was a developer who found testing and then somehow slid into management. So if the zombie apocalypse comes, I'm dead first because I know nothing else. So why is this so hard? Um, and I don't know about you, but if you have used software, which I assume that you have, you have probably come across errors or warnings that made you think, did a human even write that? And they can be incredibly unhelpful and even misleading, which you've probably come across when you've tried to debug them. Why is it so hard to just tell us what went wrong and what do we need to fix in order to get on with whatever it was, is we want to do? So in the year of 2023, why do we still get this? And I know uh, there's not a lot of web examples here because these types of messages are funnier and easier to prove a point with. Why do we get this? Well, I believe that messages tell a story and that story is about choices, about compromises, about the world they live in. So I want to, with you, look a bit into that. So the way we write messages, alerts, warnings, I'm going to use those in a weird interconnected way throughout this talk. We write them in a way where we try to balance different type of requirements that clash. So we want to use messages to guide our users to get through point A to point B with as little friction as possible, because then we get their money. But then we also want to be able to debug problems fast and easy. And we want our applications to be secure. We don't want to leak anything that can be exploitable. We want to be able to handle a high load with low response time. We want to have data that's accurate, that is consistent, that is available. We want to keep services self-contained. We want separation of concerns. We want to avoid duplicates and more. And I say those clashes a bit, and I want to show you a bit why. So when, when it comes to guiding users, we typically implement things like front-end validation. So live or almost live, as close to live as we can get, validation that makes sure that the users input what we need them to input in the format we want them to input it. So today, this is basically an industry standard. We have ways that Someone decided at some point to try, and today that's just how we do it. So we have marking mandatory fields with asterisks, or using red text or frames around things to show there's something wrong with your input here. And we figured out that if we can get a user to pick a value, 
instead of typing themselves, we would avoid having 10 Darth Vaders with different spellings in our database. And we have things like autocomplete. All of these are great for guiding our users to give us what we need. And they make sure that they don't have to click on a button before they get that message. However, each of these is a tiny interruption in itself. If we implement it too soon, it will be annoying, because what if you're typing in a field and it starts telling you that the input you're giving it is wrong, but you're not done inputting it yet? So you haven't written a complete date yet. Of course, it's going to be an incomplete date. That's going to be annoying. But if the validation comes when you're already three fields away, that's too late. That's also going to be annoying. And they will fail one day. At some point, a user is going to input something that you didn't think about, and they're going to bypass that validation. But they are cheap, at least today, when we have fast network connections, or at least most of our users have. We don't have to care that much about keeping our front ends as tiny as possible, because I'm a dinosaur. Uh, I care very much about tiny front ends, but you don't really do that anymore. It's, it's cheap to have validation here. And since these are so close to the users, it's easy to write them in a way that feels very human-centric, so they make sense to a user. They understand what they did wrong. But then, there's the security aspect. So from a security perspective, we would prefer to not give away any information at all, but we know that doesn't work. So we want to give away as little information as possible. So an example is that you don't want to tell the user here that that email address is or is not in use because then that can be exploited. You just want to give a, a, a vague message that something's wrong here. We want to keep our assets safe. We want to avoid leaking information. So we don't want to tell the user exactly what our password requirement is, because then you can use that to figure out information about our security, our encryption, our um, how, we, how we validate our password. But as a user, if you don't know that, it can be incredibly annoying to keep trying and trying and trying and not figuring out what those requirements are. So from a security perspective, you want to think, how could someone exploit this message? And what would be the worst thing if they managed to do it. And then we have accessibility, because we want all of our users to be able to use our system. So from an accessibility perspective, we want to think about, um, can we support screen readers? Uh, are we using accessible ways of, valid of validating inputs? Can the users get through our system without a mouse, just using the keyboard. What about the language we use? Is it simple enough? Or are we using a lot of business jargon or, or very complicated language? And that red text I mentioned that we tend to use, that is excluding a big group of people who will not be able to figure out that that text is red. So we can't only use red to signal something. And then we also have some things that are maybe closer to your heart. We want performance, we want scalability, we want reliability. So we want response times to keep as low as possible, even when the high, uh, load is high. We want to keep data accurate, available. 
We want our services to be self-contained. We want separation of concerns, as the two previous speakers have talked about. So we want to avoid traffic. We want to avoid uh, I.O. Um, tasks. We might even want to keep our error messages as generic as possible because that's lower complexity than having all of these tailored messages. And of course, we want to make sure that even if we have validation in all of these different parts, which I urge you to have, make sure they validate in the same way. And then, of course, there's also debugging. And from a debugging perspective, we want all the information. We want to know what went wrong, why did it go wrong, where did it go wrong, and why did we actually want it to be. So from a debugging perspective, this might be the perfect error message. For a user, it is not. It is not helpful to a user. And as I mentioned, I'm a dinosaur. Back in the day, we used to solve this by hiding it behind a little copy details to clipboard or send this to a developer or something. And I'm very amused when I open something that's been around since I was coding, and this is still intact in those. I love that. So there are a bunch of conflicts in perspectives. We can't be too vague because then our users won't figure out how to get through our system. But we can't be, give them too much information because then a bad actor could use that to exploit. We want to be helpful, we want to be secure, we want um, our main user group to have a smooth ride and all the glossiness, all of the nice animations that we want to give them. But we also want to make sure um, that if you have the need of any accessibility tool, you can also use the system. So there's a lot of conflicts to think about. So I'm going to leave that a bit and talk about tech stack, because I don't know if you noticed it, but messages that come from different parts of the tech stack have slightly different characteristics. So front-end validation has a set of characteristics. It's pretty much real-time, and it kind of sounds like a receptionist or a service worker. It's very friendly, it's very human-centric, and it kind of stops you before you step into that puddle. So, excuse me, but you really need to enter an email address in this field. So, it might look like something like this. Language is kind. Instructions are very specific. Very human-centric language. And we use those for, I mean, for a lot of purposes, but they are often about guiding our users, helping them get from start to finish. We use it to sanitize format, to sanitize input, and catch things early and close to the user. They are, however, uh, limited, so you can't trust them. Um, I mean, Feel free to have as much front-end validation as you want, as long as you don't only have front-end validation, because we will get past that as users. And then when we look at back-end or, or APIs or, or middleware or whatever you have, they happen a bit later. So they happen when you do an action, you press a button or you submit something. And they sound more like a lawyer or a police. They are either like a direct order, they can be vague, or they use very business-centric language. So something like this. You have your classic JSON and your HTTP responses and such. So these are more aimed at security. They are protection, about ba bad, protection against bad data, protection against attacks. And this is where we fit all of our business rules in. So they are very business rule centric. And again, if we catch things here, 
we don't have to send stuff down to the database, which is nice. But if we catch things here instead of the front end, it feels more of you're breaking the user flow. So the user has to pause and go back. Um, duplication of, of validations in multiple places. Again, this is not a problem. I want you to have it. And we also have a lot of generic, like catch all errors here. So something like this, oops, something went wrong. Doesn't tell the user a lot of, inf of information, but hopefully today, behind this, there's a lot of logging of information. So indirectly, this will help the users because hopefully the developers will be looking through those error messages and trying to figure out problems. And then when we come to database or, or data storage, whatever data storage you have, they kind of sound like a robot. So they are very, um, often very technical. They are very square. And here we are looking at things like data integrity, data quality, and this is our last line of defense. Because if I, as a user or as a tester, manage to get bad data past this, that's when I can really, really break your systems. But if we don't catch things before they get to the database, we have been sending a lot of traffic unnecessarily if we could have caught it earlier. And a lot of context has been lost between whatever the user inputted and the error message we get. So these error messages can be really, really hard to understand for a user. So they can look something like this. Now, I happen to know what this means because I've been programming against databases for 20 something years, but a user wouldn't understand what this means. Or if you're really unlucky, you end up with something like this that you can't even control because this is the actual database shutting down. This could, of course, also be the mail server or an integrating service that you have no control over. But you still need to relay that information back to the user in a way that they will understand. So with each step that we move from the user back to, well, in this case, our mail server, we lose context. We lose connection to our users. And it becomes harder to explain to them what actually went wrong. So looking at an database error message in the front end. I mean, I would say you're lucky if you get that clear of an error message because SMTP error 501, you can actually Google and figure out what went wrong. But what often happens is that we don't get that. We get a generic misleading um, error message that is really, really hard to debug. So it looks like something went wrong when in reality the mail server couldn't handle the, e the email format. So it's showing you the symptoms instead of the root cause. So just a quick recap of that. Front end close to the users, you reduce traffic, but it's less secure. Back end APIs close to the business layer, you only have to transport things one step and it's non-negotiable. Please have validation here if in no other place. Database close to the data, last lane of the line of defense. So when you think about how you build your 
error messages, alerts. Think about the entire ecosystem. Because there are contracts that will break, there are parts that you are not able to influence, but the user is still going to pin the problem on you. There are more error types than this, but there are at least four groups that we can group um, errors in. We have all of the things that are, available, are, are connected to availability, so servers being down or, or services being down. We have things that are connected to authentication, so the user doesn't have whatever rights they should have to do this. The very big group of bad input, so the user entered something that is not what you expected. And then the giant unknown. Something happened, we expected something else to happen, we don't really know what to do about it. What I want you to do is to learn things outside of whatever is your normal scope. Because it will, be, it will make you better at what you're doing. So, in this case, I assume most of you here are developers. Then maybe you can learn more about user experience. Or accessibility. Or mail servers. And I want you to think about how much information you can get from those messages that feel only like gibberish when you start looking at them. And what I usually get at this point, I'm going to uh, avoid getting these questions afterwards. I get questions like, so what is the best practice? How do I make this perfect? Or my favorite, where is the checklist I can send to my developers, which are product managers, ask me. And if you take away one thing from this talk, it is that there is none. There is no perfect. It's all a matter of context, and it's all a matter of choices and priorities. Because you can't perfectly meet all of those conflicting requirements. If you aim to be 100% secure and never risk leaking any information, your users are not going to understand anything when they get the error messages. But if you give them all of the information, you're going to leak information that someone will exploit. If you strive to reduce code complexity as much as possible, you will probably go for generic error messages for as much as you can. But those will be unhelpful to your users. They will be unhelpful to your customer support. They will be unhelpful when you try to debug. But if you try to write tailored error messages for every single thing that can go wrong, then you're going to add a lot of cost for maintenance, for development. So everything comes with a cost. Mm -hmm. And I've had really smart developers say, but Lena, I can solve that. I just build a framework. I'm going to build an alert system. So kind of like a design system, but for messages. And once we have that, it's going to be super cheap to just add new messages all the time. And I know there's a bunch of these out there, and I've, I've even built one at one point. Uh, so you add scalability. It is cheap to add new messages. But it also means that you have another code base to maintain. You have added new dependencies, and it has cost you time to build it. If you try to be 100% inclusive at all times, 
that will mean that you spend a lot of time writing messages that are very easy to understand, they work in every corner of the world, and they can deal with any accessibility tool out there. But that also comes at a cost. It comes at a cost in building it, but it also might cause your main user group to be less happy because it might mean that they don't get the same glossiness, the same level of flair that they are used to. But on the other hand, if you only work towards the majority, you're going to lose out of customers that need those accessibility um, features. And you're probably going to break a few accessibility laws while you're doing it. If you try to catch every problem as soon as it happens, that will mean that your users feel secure, they feel helped. But if you do it too much, it might also feel like micromanagement. It will, can be annoying to a user. And again, it's going to cause you code complexity. It's going to add lines of code that you don't necessarily need. But if you don't have enough of it, that's also going to be annoying because problems are going to be um, relayed back to the users too, uh, too late. So the feedback loop is too long. And yeah, I know. This is way too confusing. I'm sorry, you're probably going to leave this talk knowing less than when you entered. But my point is that instead of doing things the same way you've always done, always listening to the same priorities, always picking the same solution, nothing's going to change. So I want you to ask questions. I want you to consider the context you are in. And then decide what's right this time. So, some helpful questions you could ask is, how important is this particular feature? Is it worth investing in that added complexity? Do we expect this problem to happen a lot? Or is it maybe okay if that once in a blue moon the users get an unhelpful message? Is this standard feature that works the same way in a hundred other applications. Maybe there's even an industry standard for how these messages should look. Or is this something completely unique to us, where we can set the standard? Can this feature make us a lot of money? Is it worth investing in making sure the users get through this particular feature as smoothly as possible. And of course, can this feature cost us a lot of money? If this data is exploited, can that cost us a lot of money? What's the worst thing that can happen? And then of course, there's also other things that will affect your choices. There are things like who are your loudest stakeholders? Are those stakeholders the most important stakeholders? Or are they always getting their way because they happen to be loud? What's your current tech? What does your architecture look like? Is there a design system in place that you have to stick to? Is there technical depth that's hindering you from being innovative when it comes to this? Of course, money and time. There's never enough money and time, but just how much money and how much time can you spend on this will affect. And then trends. I've been working in IT since 1999, and I, can, I, can, I could almost draw a map over what roles have had the most influence over those times. So at some point, testing was really, really important, or test-ers were really, really important, and we had a lot of influence 
in, in the systems. But we weren't really good at things like user experience or security. So those perspectives were not as prioritized. Today, design is really important. So we spend a lot of effort on helpful error messages. Data analysis is growing. So that's going to become a perspective to, to consider. And who knows what's the next trend. And then, of course, whoever you have in your team is, or in your organization is also going to affect how senior are they? What experience do they have? If they've built 10 alert systems historically, they are likely going to try to do it here as well. And just like your taste, your, your personal preferences as, as the team will affect. So you can't perfectly meet all of the demands, all of the requirements, all of the perspectives. Trends change. Whatever voice is louder varies. What you are building shifts. And whoever is in your team, your organization, will also change over time. So I want to give you, I want to leave you with a call for action. I want you to challenge your default way of doing this. So if you are in this room and you are a designer, I want you to think about what perspectives are you missing when you're focusing on user experience. If you're a product manager, I want you to consider, have I thought about the code complexity when I write these requirements, when I do the, the planning of how we're going to build this? And if you're a developer, I want you to think about, am I considering all of these different aspects? Am I taking them into consideration? Or am I just following whoever has the strongest voice right now? And do you understand why we want to build them, design them in a particular way? What are you disregarding? What are you not choosing when you're making the choice? Thank you. Lena, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for questions. Anybody who would like to have a question or have a discussion with Lena, this is the chance. Please raise your hand really high up so I can see it. There it is. Okay. Uh, Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask, how did it go with the alert framework? Did, was it successful, useful? In that particular system, yes, amazing. Um, I would not choose it for the systems I'm working with now. Okay, so can you say in which cases would you recommend it? Um, so that application uh, is a giant monolith with very, very complicated insurance logic going back to the 60s. Um, and we spend probably a year building that system. So now that it's in place, it works great. But I would not choose to put that money if I would build that system today. So I think the reason it worked was because that was more of a waterfall project. We had the money. Um, and it was really, really important to be able to um, have non-developers able to change the messages or add new ones. So that's why it was successful in that case. I would never build it for the banking app I work with now. Thank you. Any more questions? Before I release you for lunch, there we are. Can I ask you to pass this along? Hi. Um, isn't it a, an important consideration on how to design your UI? Uh, also the law, European uh, accessibility laws that companies had, have to adhere to from 2025 onwards, I believe. Yeah. Um 
that's why I said if you don't take that in, into consideration, you will break laws uh, at some point. Um, and, and that's a choice companies make all the time, every day. But yeah. And I could, I could talk for hours about accessibility, but I decided not to spend too much time on that. I think it could be a conference on its own. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right? Probably is. Probably is. We should actually think about that. All right. Shall I take one more before we, before we break for lunch? No, I think... Lena, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Everybody, enjoy lunch, and we'll see you right back here for the next session immediately after that. Thank you.